Thank you very much and uh, good morning to everyone. Today is a beautiful weather, uh, even here in Brussels. So I'm sure that all of us would prefer to be somewhere together when we can discuss uh, these very important issues in, in person and launch uh, this uh, long awaited debate with all Europeans how to build better, more sustainable, greener, more resilient uh, Europe. This was, this was the plan, but unfortunately, as many other plans, uh, this was prevented for now, I would like to uh, underline by the uh, COVID uh, crisis. But nevertheless, at, uh, first and foremost, I would like uh, to thank Maria Laszlo and all this excellent team of the young people with whom I had the chance to chat a little bit before we started uh, our webinar for organizing this event uh, anyway say in these uh, digital conditions, uh, we've been joking a little bit that all of us had to go through the crash course in digital skills uh, to simply manage uh, uh, to work in these new conditions, to use these new platforms and, and to be in touch and most importantly to deliver for the European citizens. So the 9th of May, as you know, is very symbolic date. I mean, it's uh, now 70 years for the famous uh, Schumann Declaration, and I would uh, also underline that it's 75 years uh, since uh, the most horrific conflict, the most terrible uh, conflagration uh, of the mankind uh, just ended, Second uh, World War. Now you have a lot of documentaries on the TV which you can watch, and even though, uh, you know, I saw many of this film, still you are surprised by one side, the, the barbarity, uh, of uh, that conflict and from other side the, the, the enormous destruction but also the will of the people to prevent these horrors to happen in the future and I think they responded to that uh, horrors of the past by creating United Europe and I think we should never forget that if you are celebrating the 75 years of peace that this is actually the longest peaceful period that Europe ever had unfortunately for the centuries uh, we've been fighting with each other and now, thanks to our common European destiny, we work with each other, we collaborate, we cooperate and we build, I believe, a, a better present and a, a better future. I also uh, uh, would like uh, to underline the, the importance uh, that uh, we would proceed with the projects uh, like uh, we just have been presented by our two young researchers, by Tamás and Daniel. Because I think to understand uh, our population, to listen more carefully to the young, uh, middle-aged and elderly, is very important because we see how the things are changing over the time, but at the same time, uh, how some trends are stable. And if we are talking about uh, pandemic and about COVID-19, I think there is one consensus among all researchers, that if pandemia served for something, it was accelerator, of already existing threats. From one side, the lockdown made sure that we never spent so much time with the closest family as before. And therefore, the, the family values, which we so much underline in the report, are, I think, fully, fully understandable. The people, they like quieter streets. Uh, they like uh, bluer skies, cleaner air, cleaner waters. And we are all happy uh, when we see new pictures with the crystal clear water in Venice. So I think that this would be also very important for the future because we have seen that what just a couple of weeks of uh, uh, stopped economy can do for the humanity, can do for, for our planet. Of course, we have to go back to work, we have to start to produce, but uh, definitely there will be enormous pressure from our citizens uh, to look for these new ways of working, for the new ways of delivering, for the more sustainable ways of, uh, uh, of producing the goods and uh, services. And I think that uh, very much goes uh, in line with uh, what uh, the Europeans expect uh, uh, from the policymakers and uh, decision, ma decision makers for the future. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had a very dynamic, uh, passionate discussions in the European Parliament and also within our uh, socialist and progressive uh, families uh, uh, in the Parliament, but I would say in all our member states, uh, how to launch the Conference on the Future of Europe. And I remember, I know that Dominic is with us, we've been exchanging several papers on how to do it in a 
best possible way, how to engage the people, how to make sure that we would reach as many of them as of possible. They would see that this is also their project, that they would feel the ownership uh, for common uh, European uh, destiny. Of course, a couple of weeks later, we've been in totally different situation, which I also think were, uh, already impacted a lot of a little bit that survey, which uh, we just did uh, a minute before I started my introductory uh, remarks. I think uh, that uh, that first moments of the crisis after the initial shock through which uh, all the member states, including the European Commission, had to go through, we had to focus on something super dramatic saving the lives of our people, saving the lives of patients, sa saving the lives of uh, health uh, professionals, making sure that borders are open uh, for the supplies of, uh, of, of goods and uh, medical equipment, the things which we've been taken for granted for years and years and suddenly we had to fight for them. After that, we very quickly realized that with the lockdown, what, what should be the next big challenge is how to save as many jobs as possible. And we had to come up uh, with the solutions like this uh, SURE scheme, which should help uh, the member states uh, to preserve as many jobs as possible simply by allowing the companies uh, to keep the people on the payroll during uh, the confinement uh, period. And I believe that this would be very important for the future, for relaunch of the economy, because our people would be still in the job. We know that we have high qualified uh, labor force and I think it would be huge, huge difference between us and for example Americans when we see how the, how the, the jobless rate is spiraling up uh, uh, because I believe that our people would be ready and would be, would be, would be prepared to start to work immediately once uh, the epidemiological criteria would allow it. And now we are in the phase where we are working very hard on relaunching the economy. And I think that uh, here again this would be one of the tests Maybe, as Maria Joao just said before our conference, the biggest test for, for Europe yet. Because uh, never uh, since uh, the European Union was created, uh, we've been facing such a drop of uh, GDP, 7.5% in a couple of months. Of course, there is also the promise and expectations, if we do things right, that we can jump back very quickly uh, to, the, to the rapid growth next year, even though it will take some time to level it up, but we have to do it right. So therefore, I hope that in the coming uh, weeks we will, will come with very ambitious remedy to how to uh, relaunch Europe and how to fight the problems which our participants uh, understood uh, that is uh, uh, the most important right now, fight inequalities. Because simply we see that some of the countries can, let's say, uh, fuel much more money through the state aid into the economy than the others. And we do not want uh, the result of this crisis uh, being that we would have even bigger divergence among the member states or in between the, the regions. And that we would simply have a group of the regions or the countries or the people who would be left behind. It's definitely against uh, the policy priorities of uh, our political family. And I think that we very well understand this imperative also in the European Commission. Therefore, we want to have uh, adapted to the crisis new multi-annual financial framework proposal, which is, uh, all of you know, is uh, the proposal for the seven years budget. And in addition to that, we want to use uh, uh, the high rating of the European economy for creating the recovery fund, uh, which could help us to inject uh, enormous amount of money uh, into the European economy to, to relaunch and to do it in, I would say, the new way. Because uh, when we looked uh, through the uh, survey, it was quite clear how people uh, value the environment, how people are realizing more and more as we do right now on the digital infrastructure, and how we do not want to be surprised anymore by the fact that in some, for example, medical products, we are so heavily dependent uh, on the imports uh, from some far, far away countries in Asia. Therefore, we would like to make sure that the investments which we are currently preparing would be channeled in a forward manner, that it would allow us to bounce our economy forward, that would be greener, more sustainable, 
that uh, would be it would be future oriented based on on uh, the, the the progressive and modern digital infrastructure and that we would pay much more attention to the resilience not only for the health sector but also to have more closer look at uh, global value chains uh, where we can still afford to have uh, flying in the, the spare parts or the different uh, critical materials from far abroad or where we need uh, maybe to look for diversification as we had to do with the energy supplies just a couple of uh, years ago and diversify our suppliers, diversify um, uh, also the, the countries uh, of origin or companies which are so crucial for our economy or where we would decide that this particular product we better produce also in Europe because it's of critical importance. So all this, I believe, would make our Europe much more stronger, resilient, uh, greener and uh, more modern. And I think that uh, because of uh, this crisis, all these trends which been somehow lingering uh, in our thinking, which been somehow being postponed for later, we now accelerated and, and presented in much more vivid manner and therefore also our citizens would definitely uh, expect uh, much more robust uh, resolutions to all these challenges uh, which are, uh, which are uh, ahead of us. I think that uh, what uh, would be also the, the, the challenge in the coming weeks, uh, months and years, because I think that uh, fight against uh, inequalities and making sure that all this uh, uh, transition from the old into the new economy, from the, the current hibernation to the launching of the economy would be done as a uh, fair, as a, a just, uh, transition uh, and in, in, in a way where we would offer all kinds of possibilities uh, uh, to our people that nobody would really uh, be left behind. I am not surprised because I have also uh, three children and I talk to them a lot about that uh, pessimism which is there that maybe this is the first generation of the young people uh, which doesn't believe that they would be better off than their parents and I think that the worries come uh, from the climate change, from the com complexity uh, of this world, and also the, the challenges they, they face, because they know very well that if it comes to the labor market, the top 10 professions of today didn't exist just five years ago. So for them, it means that they will have to be working on their skills all their life. They will be constantly pushed to learn something new, to manage new technologies, to adjust in the, into the, the new environment, and, and uh, it's very demanding. I think all of us who are working now on this digital platform, we know how challenging it is to be permanently focused and to talk to the, to the screen instead uh, of to the, to the, to the real, real people. So therefore, that push for having a little more free time, time for hobbies, for family, for friends, I fully, fully understand that. And I think it will have to be part of the new European social model. I believe that all these topics which are so 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 crucial i think would be excellent feature for the conference on the future of europe because i believe that people want to discuss them people want to tell us uh, what they expect uh, from the policy maker and decision makers and i think they want to be part of that search for better european uh, future and really to be involved within this uh, exchange among themselves uh, and with us and i think it's our it's our duty to make sure that uh, we would allow them and we would make sure that as many Europeans as possible uh, would uh, participate in that. I would like to reassure you that if it comes to the European Commission and our commitment uh, to the conference remains, uh, remains unshakable. I think the European Parliament and the Commission already adopted uh, how ambitious we want to be uh, in uh, these debates. As you know, we're still waiting uh, for the decision of our member states on the council, how we launch it together, because it will have to be very well uh, organized and concerted uh, effort. And I believe that once the conditions would, would, would permit that, we would proceed uh, with the conference uh, uh, as quickly as possible. And I believe that also this type of interactions uh, would be very useful because many people will not be able to 
uh, reach personally, but through the digital platforms and the discussions like we have today, it should be possible. If you allow me uh, uh, to conclude on the, the European dream, I would uh, use the phrase which I found in your report. And I very much like it, not only because it was uh, written by a very good friend of mine, Jeremy Rifkin, because I think it's very well uh, reflects uh, the today's uh, reality. Jeremy Rifkin uh, has said that the American dream may be worth dying for. The new European dream is worth living for. And I think these are very powerful words. This is what distinguishes us Europeans from anybody else. This is why we are uh, such an attraction magnet uh, for many societies and many people outside Europe who like how we cooperate, who appreciate uh, our uh, social model, and uh, who I believe uh, keep fingers crossed that Europe would play even more active, more positive role in the global affairs. And therefore, I would just wish to all of us a happy Europe Day, and I would, I, and, uh, I'm very much looking forward to the discussions and to the questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President, for sharing your reflection today uh, on Europe Day. Uh, you started with uh, reminding uh, us of the special importance that this day entails, 75 years of peace. Uh, the challenge now that the European Commission, that Europe's policymakers are facing now uh, in the response to the COVID pandemic, uh, the healthcare response, the economic response. So the plan that the European Commission and the, the Progressive Family have at hand to address these and most importantly, to come closer to citizens' expectations. These issues that have been reflected in the European Dream Survey, in the European Dream Report, could very well uh, feature the discussions on the future of Europe. So thank you very much, uh, Vice President, um, for your insights. Um, and uh, for our participants online, uh, you're very lucky because uh, Vice President uh, Mara Sefcovic has conveyed that you would be happy to take um, one, two questions uh, as time is running out, unfortunately. Uh, we will just have time for one question. Um, and uh, from the registrations, we also believe that we have a question coming from Portugal. Um, so uh, perhaps the FEPS team can also then uh, launch the question here online so that the Vice President can reply. Hi, hello. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Vice President, and also thank you to FEPS and to Policy Solutions for this important report. My name is Mafaldo Damazouinas, I'm from Portugal. Um, you mentioned your children. Um, and my question is exactly about uh, young European citizens. Um, their life trajectories, uh, our life trajectories, they've been um, and they will continue to be profoundly transformed by the consequences of the financial crisis, now COVID and also climate. And so a career, a good life, a stable environment are increasingly uh, unlikely dreams uh, for many of these citizens, unfortunately. And so my question is, how can the EU minimize as much as possible the impact of this crisis on the lives of Daniels and Generation Z, uh, and therefore guaranteeing that they will also continue to enjoy the European dream? That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mafra, for, for, uh, for this uh, question, because I think that would be uh, the question, uh, not only this Commission, but I, I believe that the whole European Union would have to find the right answer to in uh, this coming decade. So if you allow just a few uh, very quick reflections, I think that our paramount uh, principle should be to build fair society. We have to offer fair chance uh, the, the young generations uh, to get uh, high quality education. And I think that we also have to be very fair with our young people to point them at the appropriate uh, time, uh, what type of education, what type of specializations uh, is, uh, uh, is, is the, let's say, more, most uh, perspective uh, uh, from the perspective of the uh, labor market. And also to give the young people, I would say, second chance uh, in uh, adding up uh, the new skills uh, they would need uh, to find even better 
uh, positions uh, on the labor market. As I said, unfortunately, your generation will be faced with this permanent challenge to upgrade your skills, to learn new things, to adapt to the, to the, to the, to the new ways with especially digital, but also green transformation will bring uh, to, to our lives. And I think that uh, fairness should be also absolutely crucial if it comes uh, to such a things like pay. I mean, we in Europe are uh, struggling for years to have the equality and the pay transparency, especially if it comes uh, between male and uh, female workers. And we are also, as the European Commission, preparing very clear, uh, clear position and clear, clear proposals in, in that respect, because I, I think that uh, as a father of two daughters and one son, I, I, I also see it as a father that how challenging it is, uh, especially for, for young female workers to be, uh, to be fairly remunerated uh, very often for the same, same job as my colleagues uh, do. So therefore, I think that the fairness in uh, how we are rewarding uh, the work must be there. And the third uh, step would be also, we have to make sure that once uh, uh, you are becoming to the, to the pension age, uh, that uh, you uh, should be able uh, to have very decent uh, life uh, because you devoted uh, uh, your entire working career to help the society to be, to be part uh, uh, of uh, the, the, the European nations, uh, actually achieve enormously a lot uh, if you look uh, at uh, how Europe uh, looks now and uh, how was it uh, 30, 40 years ago. So I think that fairness, uh, that would be one of the elements which we all have to push for. And then, of course, uh, the, the modernity and also making sure that we as a Europeans will stand tall if it comes uh, to this increased uh, geopolitical competition. Uh, as I was already saying a few times in the past, uh, I am a strong believer in uh, our absolute uh, determination which we have to demonstrate that not only now but also in post 2030 world Europe uh, would belong among the top three economies. Why? Because it would allow us to project our values globally because it would uh, allow us uh, to work uh, and make sure that this planet is a, is a better place because we, we need uh, this commitment of Europe to better planet to multilateral solutions and also to make sure that the, the, the most, the more affluent ones would take care also of the, of the countries which are struggling uh, because they are still going through development stage. Uh, and also to have a strong economy is uh, a guarantee that we could further develop our European social model. So this would be just uh, uh, some of the thoughts which I would offer right now. But your question is absolutely relevant one, and I'm sure it would be discussed in all fora, in all agoras we would meet, because to, to set it right, to find the right answers would also determine how the Europe would look like in the coming decades. Thank you.